This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian working in the arts across the state. I'm your host, Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today, I'm speaking with visual artist and founder director of Friends of the Chactuma Swamp, Robin Whitfield. Robin, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. We have so much to talk about, but we're going to just go to the beginning of it all. And I just want to hear a little bit about how you grew up. We're from the same hometown, Clinton, Mississippi. And uh, I would just love to hear what started your career as an artist. Um, you know, I sometimes I think to myself, like how lucky, like, uh, like how lucky I am to have been born in Clinton and to my parents and live on my street because it formed me. My mom is, uh, is an artist and taught eighth grade art. Um, Starting when I was in the third grade, she started teaching in the Clinton Public Schools. And so that was hugely informative to have. I mean, I just thought all kids had like a studio to play in with paintbrushes and paint and, you know, all my mom's art friends. And she, you know, so that she ended up going to, uh, to get her master's at Mississippi College, too, when I was in maybe fourth or fifth grade. And, um, and she would take me to classes, night classes, you know, and I remember sitting in her drawing classes and Dr. Gore and. I don't even know who all, but that, that was just, I just, that was my normal world. And then she uh, also allowed me to go on all this, the field trips that her um, classes would take even when I was younger. So we went to, this was way before the Walter Anderson Museum, but my cause, my mom was an art teacher. She knew about Walter Anderson and she uh, took us down and you know, she allowed me to go to the coast with them where they could get the key and go look at his little house with the little room and the community center and stuff like that. So, I mean, that was hugely informative. And then, you know, road trips where we hit, we always had to hit a museum or some kind of weird, funky uh, folk artist maybe that she knew about uh, on one of our road trips. Um, and so that was, that was huge. And then our neighborhood um, had uh, you know, lots of cool, creative people. Uh, one in particular was Wyatt Waters. So, I just, uh, you know, mom and I would often on a weekly basis just, you know, walk down to his house or, or I'd ride my bike and there he'd be out in his yard uh, painting or working on his greenhouse or something like that. And so to me, art, being an artist and art just seemed like a normal thing. But now looking back, you know, on how did I, I you know, how I did I become the artist that I am, meaning I work outside in the landscape, loving nature. Um, you know, watching Wyatt and knowing Walter Anderson is really my first two kind of real artists that I knew about. What they both had in common was working directly from life and um, and with watercolor. So that just kind of, I think, seared itself inside of me as that's what artists do. So that's, that's definitely something I want to hear more about that you uh, paint on location. Is that, is that always what you do? And that your medium is watercolor, right? Or your fate yeah, I'd say, I'd say, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the time. That is true. I'm, I think like all creative people, I'm highly experimental and I do like to play with found pigments. But honestly, that's watercolor, too. When I do find a pigment in a plant or like a mineral pigment just in the earth, that's what is in certainly was in, in, in traditional paint. But, um, you know, I add water to that and, and play with it as well. So um, I, I do play with that a good bit. And but I like to play with all kinds, you know, if I ha- if I have a medium in front of me, uh, I will play with it. But, uh, you know, I consider it pretty much strictly play. Uh, watercolor is what I use um, in most of my what I would just call the work that I'm really um, serious about. Uh, of course, I, I, you know, I, I Maybe that's not quite the right word, uh, being serious, because I'm trying to learn to be very playful, but it's, it's, it's the medium I use to really stretch myself and try to communicate um, my ideas and, and really kind of be in dialogue with nature. That's where I, I, I feel like I'm most fluid with watercolor. Was watercolor your first kind of um, medium that made you fall in love with being an artist, or did you get there later? Yeah, those are really good questions. I, watercolor was probably something I've always done mm. from the point. I can't even remember a time that I wasn't painting with watercolor. My mother painted with watercolor. And so, um, 
you know, for me, it was a very natural, uh, it's just, I built, I was able to speak, you know, like if you can talk about painting, like you would talk about learning another language. I mm. learned to speak watercolor at a very early age. So it's like when you, you know, you don't really sometimes learn, you know, you don't think about when did I learn to speak English, you know, mm. I've just always painted watercolor. So it was, um, it was natural to me, but I'll say I, I gave it, not, I shouldn't say I gave it up for a while, but, um, I did it pretty seriously during high school, but when I went to college, I ended up studying at Delta State uh, with Sammy Britt, and he wanted us to use oil paints exclusively um, so he could give us the kind of, um, the kind of, I guess, direction that he knew how to give us because water, oil was his media. So, but the idea was he told us the paint didn't matter anyway. It was learning how to see and, um, you let allowing, show letting nature show us, uh, what it looks like versus having preconceived notion. And we were just gonna use oil. So once we learned how to speak that color language, you know, we could go off and maybe apply that to any medium we want. So I didn't pick watercolor back up until a couple of years after college. Oh, wow. Yeah. If you, if you just tuned in, I'm Leslie Barker with the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today on the Arts Hour, I'm talking with my guest, Robin Whitfield. So Robin, talking about, you know, using the medium of watercolor, I love that, that idea of it being a language that you learned very young. Did you always paint nature or was that, you know, also something you came across later? You know, um, I, th I have always been drawn to nature from a very young age. My mother sometimes laughs and, and just says, Robin, how, where did you come from? <laughs> but, uh, I remember her even letting me stay home from school one day because there were these certain flowers blooming and I wanted to go paint them. And I can't believe she, my mother is a school teacher and she let me stay home because she knew I was really going to go paint the flowers. Um, but I have always really honed in on nature, you know, but I will say, I mean, if any, if any listeners out there have ever tried watercolor, I guess tried, to uh, or even any media and uh, and tried to interpret nature as a young artist nature was very overwhelming for me like when I say nature if I sat into a forest and I was looking at 50 trees and all the grasses and flowers I was very frustrated my attempts at trying to paint it were never I was never very satisfied having mm -hmm. Walter Anderson's work really did help me like you know because he had this great stylized view of nature that kind of broke things down into geometry. And I, I wasn't really able to do that in, until many years later in any kind of way where, where I'm able to distill what I'm really after. Because, you, you know, there's a learning curve. I had to really understand how to use watercolor um, with a fluidity uh, that, that you just can't have when you're first beginning. But I did. I tried, had lots of awkward attempts at painting, usually mm -hmm. small things like a leaf or a mushroom or a dragonfly, something, you know, something I could hone in on versus maybe a complexity of relationships. I've gotten to where, uh, you know, I think it, uh, it, it Delta State, uh, Sammy talked to us a lot about painting is simply uh, relating one color to another or a shape. You know, you couldn't think of painting outside of relationships. And that's how I also think about nature. I mean, or life in general, everything is you can't see one thing without seeing what's next to it. You know, one, a color changes when another color is put next to it. And so is everything, and, and certainly in nature, I just, it's just so clear in nature. So now, you know, and I, I'm still growing in that understanding. And, but I have been, I started at a pretty early age with thinking about those things. Another really a wonderful thing I had happen as a teenager is I didn't study with, I didn't, I knew Sammy Britt before I entered college. And so to have a master teacher from the time I was 15 made a huge difference in him helping my, me take something that could, you know, such a huge topic like nature and uh, began to help me take baby steps towards understanding it and, and kind of, uh, in a way that did not, that, that made total sense and built a big foundation for me to work from. Um, so anyway, my mother signed me up for his uh, workshop at MC. It was an adult workshop, but he let me come in on that workshop at 15. And Ooh. so I started setting with him uh, the last two years of my, uh, my high school years. You know, he would come and teach every summer. So um, I really got a, a really strong start in, in a certain kind of thinking and working directly with nature. You know, I love hearing about how you started being an artist from, you know, if you grew up in Clinton, you know, Miss Whitfield was the art teacher and everybody knows why it statewide, you know, especially in Clinton. And also, um, you know, obviously talking about Walter Anderson, 
uh, not necessarily Clinton, but Mississippi for sure, and how all of that influenced you. How, what other ways do you say Mississippi finds its way into your work? Um, gosh, uh, I can't even, like, I, I can't imagine living somewhere other than Mississippi at this point in my life, but I, I never could imagine it because to me, Mississippi was just a, a, a a presence, a almost like a, a an entity or a being. I mean, I can't. When I think about Mississippi, uh, I think of the the you know the forest and the fields and the rivers. Um, so the land itself is so powerful. But you know, connected to the land, like it's. I, I've been trying to unpack these very questions. Like, is just a part of my philosophy as a human and an artist, and I think about it a lot. And um, now that I've gotten into natural materials, uh, just kind of looking at the source of color or the source of tools. And I look at maybe the native peoples that lived here and I, then I look back, reflect back on my work now. And I just see how much a place can really affect um, how you see the world in general. I, I just know that I'm extremely steeped in, in Mississippi and, mm -hmm. um, and I like my audience to be Mississippi. I've never been, you know, because as, as an art, as an artist, we all, I guess, have to have an audience or we want an audience, whether you're a musician or writer or painter. I don't, I feel like I, I wouldn't have thought this as a younger person needing another person to see my work to complete it. But uh, another artist mentioned that to me years ago, and I, and I really realized how true that is. So for me, I've realized I like Mississippians to see my work in particular, because they have a certain resonance with, with, what I'm painting, even if particularly if they see it, but they've never seen it, like really seen it. Maybe they encounter the plants or animals or landscape, but if I show them something that they're, that they kind of take for granted each day, but then through my painting, they really see it. Uh, I love watching that wash over someone and have them tell me a story about a certain kind of plant or a certain place that they have direct experience with. And this showed them something that they either remembered, recalled, or maybe never saw in the first place. So I, I just love my audience being Mississippi. And so I, I, I've made it where I don't really try to have a lot of shows outside the state. Mm -hmm. I've tried to find ways to have my work reach really regular people, not even, um, I'm in Karen Gallery in Tupelo, which I love being um, in a Mississippi gallery commercially. But my real interest um, in showing work is really more about being in public spaces or um, and maybe just uh, I'm still trying to even figure that out, but I, I love having a Mississippi audience. And so that's really important to me. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative Mississippians. Today, I'm talking with artist Robin Whitfield. So Robin, right before the break, we were talking um, about your painting and, and the different styles of painting and the mediums, and you mentioned using natural materials. I want to hear all about that. Tell us all about the natural materials. <laughs> all right. Um, well, I just, I'm going to tell you all that uh, that's sort of been a, a surprise to me as an artist to all of a sudden start thinking about what is pain and where did it come from. But I, I think um, I can only say that, that from the time I, I graduated from college and I, I ended up moving over to Grenada, um, I discovered a, uh, a wetland just a few blocks from where I was living and I began going there every day and that's where I was really also stumbling around trying to figure out watercolor uh, at that point because I, I realized, um, especially while I was in school in, in Delta State, there aren't many trees in Bolivar County and when I came over to Grenada and there was so, the forest was so amazing and I'd been so hungry for trees I didn't even know it. I was just, I couldn't get enough of just being in a forest. And so I spent a lot of time and I really wanted to use watercolor so I, it would be easy to take out with me and it would dry fast because oil paint is not easy to take with you in the field, especially if you're going through a lot of underbrush and stuff. So I, I had this high motivation and want to get back to my roots of watercolor. But um, I'd say, you know, maybe 
seven or eight years into just really working on my watercolor and, and getting more fluid with it, um, I, I uh, got my first kayak. Mm. And I'm mentioning the kayak because that's when I first had this, this moment, you know, with that big accident that you have that turns into be your revelation. I'm sure we all do that all the time, but I was like out painting in my kayak and I had my watercolor. I was kind of proud of it. It was going really well. You know, you should probably never think those thoughts in your head like, Ooh, I like this (laughs) because the wind picked it up right at that moment and like plopped my watercolor face down in, uh, in the swamp. I was in the swamp out there in Grenada. And so I, when I, pulled up the painting it was coated with just this brown just whatever is on the surface of swamps you know I'm gonna call it your swamp goo and um and I was of course heartbroken at first but I mean I I don't know I just maybe I'd been thinking a lot about who knows I mean I I I do love nature to the point where I was curious about that what is that you know kind of what is that on the paper but I, I saw it within, you know, just not even, it didn't even take me a minute to realize, wow, that is a beautiful color. And oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know the surface looked like that. And I, you know, could I do that intentionally? And, you know, so it started me really thinking about color on the landscape, where pigment comes from, how, you know, in wanting to then kind of interact and question nature itself I'm like wow what color are you and what do you have in there and what are you made of and like where is so it, it even felt exciting like a way to dialogue more directly with nature itself and a very play you know because it's kind of like a surprise like I had you know you don't I saw sort of squishing berries on paper or rubbing a flower on mm. paper or just looking at dirt and picking it up you know, if I could get a, a color to come off onto the paper easily I would I would try it and mushrooms and algae and just anything I could find and um, anyway, so it just became just just very entertaining, and and it showed you know it showed me nature or, or showed me things that I kind of either took didn't notice at all, or something that maybe I'd taken for granted or just didn't fully explore. It gave me this new way to to, to understand it and see it. It's kind of like when you get when you're getting to know a new friend and they just finally tell you like a a story, a childhood story or something, you know, where, you, where you're learning more about it and you see that person differently, like, oh, you know, that's how I was feeling about nature through working with these natural pigments. And I've always been a big fan of um, art created by traditional cultures. I mean, and of course, it finally occurred to me that all art created before the, at least probably not even 200 years ago, like 150 years ago, had been created with natural pigments. So I probably was told that in art history class, and I, pro- I mean, I, I didn't hear it properly, you know. Mm. And um, but I, it, just, it just blew my mind, and it made me look at all art differently. I really dove into Aboriginal art about that time, and I'd always loved Chinese brush painting. But you know, you just don't think about you know, every, every, all art materials coming directly from some source of the earth and that culture itself is born of what the people who live in a certain place, what they have access to or what they can trade for, you know, and that makes you look at the Renaissance differently. And, you know, now I can go back and read about Michelangelo. He couldn't afford you know, a certain blue. And so he'd have to wait till someone would buy it for him to add it into his paintings. You know, it's just, it, it you know, and that, that coming from a certain stone and a certain part of the world. I think maybe that from the Middle East. I, I'm not, I can't you know, remember that exactly where some of foreign pigments are. I'm very interested in that, but I must say I'm extremely interested in just what's right in front of me, nature itself. And mm-hmm. so I've delved into kind of looking about, you know, what, what natural materials have been used throughout history. But um, what it comes down to is I've realized I'm not so interested in, in making my own paint or say making my own tools that I want to use on a daily basis, like to do my watercolor. I'm truly interested in natural materials because of the, the deeper relationship it gives me to a place, a sense of place. Cause I'm looking at nature. When I say nature, that's such a vague term. I like to go to a place like Lee Tart Nature Preserve or Tallahatchie National Wildlife Refuge. These are places right around me. And I want to feel the, collect, the, the collective, all the living things, the ecosystem, how, how they interact, their relationship, and me, you know, me t- as a part of that. And so to me, playing directly with the materials is a way of interacting in a way I in a new way, you know, it's, it's a way of communicating outside of language for me. Mm. 
You're listening to MPB Think Radio. This is the Mississippi Arts Hour, and I'm your host, Leslie Barker, talking with artist Robin Whitfield. Now, Robin, you were just talking about places that are important to you, and I really got to know you through some of your community work with those places, uh, one of which being the, the Chachuma Swamp. So I would love for everybody to hear about the work that you have been doing through conservation and art with the swamp. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, probably the place I've spent the most time um, over the past 25 years is a place that is now called Chukchuma Swamp. It's a 300 acre um, wetland that's, I'd say, no more than four or five blocks from my studio, and it's a place owned by the city of Grenada. So I've been going out there and just exploring, painting, uh, explore, you know, just discovering uh, what it, what a wetland is, what nature is, who I am, and so over the past, I'd say, 10 years, um, or maybe, maybe, I would say in 2009, I approached the city directly about um, forming a friends group and, and taking care of this 300 acres, uh, not, you know, not in a huge way at that point. I was just thinking we could put some trails out there, pick up trash. Um, I, at that point, I didn't even know hardly what it meant to take care of. I, I never really pondered it that deeply, but, um, and they were very enthusiastic. They, they encouraged me and um, helped me when they could. We ended up finding some really cool uh, plants out there and realized we had a pretty intact ecosystem. I got the state involved and they, they, and I got them involved with the National Heritage Area Program just to have someone agree with me that this is a cool place because you can get emotionally attached to stuff and think it's something that it's not, you know. But I had them agree that, oh wow, this is a really, really cool spot. So I'm, I'm kind of setting the stage for what's ended up happening over the past few years. Um, so it's that place I can just always count on I can, if I'm having a busy week or not. I mean, I can just easily access nature. And I think that's really important for us in Mississippi. Most of us have pretty easy access to nature. I, you know, growing, uh, growing up in Clinton, I realize now I didn't have as easy access as I do here in Grenada, but I could always uh, get up on the Natchez Trace and run down to Rocky Springs or just you know, play in the woodlot behind our, our house, which is now a neighborhood. I, uh, <laughs> the Clinton Nature Center didn't exist then, and I played in what, what, what it's, you know, it's there now as a nature center. But anyway, but it's not, you know, I, I'm realizing, you know, this easy access is important. And so I, I, that's part of my, also my motivation of wanting to have these trails for, for the city is like, wow, this is look at this great little place that school kids could come to or, or, or just residents could because it's right across from our downtown. Well, as um, you know, it's, my life had gotten pretty busy about, um, I'd say about five years ago, just the normal stuff of trying to be an artist and, and mm -hmm. figuring out how to make my living teaching and traveling and selling art. And so it just became more and more, I just went down there to paint. And I had really set up a week to go paint out there. Uh, I'd say in the fall of 2015, maybe. And I showed up and there were timber harvest ribbons everywhere uh, around the properties, that the, the city's property. And um, I could go on and on about that story, but, but you know, I basically found out uh, later that day, I just actually stopped my painting project entirely, ran down to city hall and found out that the, city had decided to cut all of their um all of their properties not just that property oh, wow. um and so that 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 was a huge turning point in my life without even questioning it i just dove right into trying to see what could be done about that and the city gave me the, the opportunity to speak at council meetings on multiple occasions and i i really tried to make a case to save this particular 300 acres because of its proximity to town and all these cool plants and animals that live there um that the state had also recognized as cool and um so anyway this this began i didn't even know i was you know i just kind of jumped into the world of conservation without even knowing that's what i was doing you know <laughs> i was an artist who loved a place and who have been in dialogue with the, with the place. And that, that is sort of the danger of loving something or, or doing art, you know, art and art, art makers. And when I say art, all people are artists. And we, I could have a whole conversation about that. But we all have a, you know, we all lean towards interacting with the physical world in, 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 in a deeper way. Some people do it in the kitchen. Some people do it with, with a musical instrument. Some people like to dance or twirl or, you know, we have, mm -hmm. we have these things, but these things, you know, have us, 
come to love something. And so um, sometimes people are just good parents. And I know that people probably feel this way about their children. You just don't question it. And so I didn't question it. I didn't think about what it would do to my, my art career or whatever. I just dove. I had the freedom because I worked for myself to just dive into trying to do, see what I could do to save this 300 acres from being uh, harvested. And, um, and I used the, the tools that I had to do that were, were um, you know, the, to the only tools I had, which were, you know, art tools. I knew how to tell a story visually. Mm -hmm. I knew how to make strong graphic images that could uh, affect people. I could draw maps and I used everything I had that I, you know, that I had learned throughout all, you know, all the years of my life to, to, to try to help people see the beauty and, um, uh, just the intricacy of what was right in front of them. And it's so funny as I learned my community, first of all, barely even, they didn't even know where I was talking about. I'd have to say, you know, the swamp downtown. And you could finally get them to, to realize where you were talking about. It's a place we drive by all the time. And most people, no one had ever, you know, gotten out. Maybe they have when they were a kid. But, um, but it, it turned out to be a big community dialogue. I, you know, through, through my photography and paintings, and in illustrations, I was really able to build a case that ended up saving that 300 acres. And I didn't do it alone. I mean, I got a lot of interest, but I'm gonna say, I think the skills I had as an artist, which I've, I've you know, you kind of take for granted. I think a lot of people even don't even realize how powerful artists are, but we're able to, to, to tell, show people things that maybe other people can't. Sometimes words, well, well of course, then there's poets, you know, you can use words too. But I, I was able to get enough community and statewide support, and we were able to um, ultimately the way we saved the swamp is we we were we had to buy all the trees. The city basically just gave us that option. They they, they were willing to let us be the high bidder, and if we could purchase the trees, they would work with us on some sort of plan to save it and um, you know that for 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 longevity. So we ended up having a, a donor step up out of the woodwork after he heard the story and loan us the money to buy uh, all the trees and um, and really also built a, a, uh, a bridge of communication with the city, which that because we trust we had kind of gotten a strained relationship, the harder I pushed. So but but ultimately now um, and I'm going to give it you know, credit to me being an artist. I was able to use creativity and love to uh, get people to see something they could not see before, build relationships, you know, with, with our city itself, never burn bridges, but only, you know, build, build up on things. And now they're, they're my biggest ally. We work together mm -hmm. as a partnership. We have a lease, a 60 year lease on that property. When I say we, I ended up having to form a nonprofit to hold that lease. And we're called Friends of Chakchuma Swamp. And um, Chak Chuma, just, I know y'all are, that's what y'all are thinking. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, so I'll just go on and tell you, I did not know the, the area that is the 300 acres. Uh, it didn't, it had various names. I, you know, when I started going there, I'd ask, well, what is this place? And people go, oh, that's old Dump Lake. Or, oh, that's Fox Lake. <laughs> and I, yeah, there was no other name. And I really didn't like Dump Lake. And so anyway, we, we no. I ended up, um, my, my, my little collective, we had a, we hosted a competition to name it. And so the Chakchuma Swamp is, came out of that competition. And the Chakchuma name was, was turned in multiple times uh, because it turns out they're the native peoples of our area. So I'm very grateful that the historical society, they had, they've kind of, I think they got behind it. They have the ones putting the name in more than once. And so now the swamp bears the name of the people that would have lived there, that would have used those very materials I'm so fascinated with now, you know, and so now I envision them out there using the same plant fibers and the same pigments that I now am interested in. Um, and now their name gets to get back on our lips, as we say, Chakchuma, and it means red crawfish. Oh, that's amazing. That, yeah. that's, that, what a beautiful representation of a place, you know, and how, know. And, and also what a beautiful representation of how art can change things. And when we come back from the next break, I want to talk to you more about um, some of the projects or one project in particular that the community got really involved in with the swamp and with art. 
Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Carl write a song called Blue Suede Shoes that was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different artists and all-around creative Mississippians. Today, I'm speaking with visual artist Robin Whitfield. And Robin, right before the break, we were talking not just about your art, but your conservation efforts. And there was a, a project that that you received a grant for from the Mississippi Arts Commission, which is one one way I know about your work, that tied in your art and um, the conservation and brought the community in. So tell us about that project. Yeah, okay. So um, so I, I think you're referring to the Swamp Quilt Project. And yes. um, you, know how, you know how you can just, we're sitting around in a board meeting actually, uh, last year and I had a board member go wouldn't it be so cool if we had like these cool quilts so when we did field trips people could sit on the ground and then what if the quilts had cool like you know each each square might be educational and it could be like a game you know it's like and I love it when it comes from my board members you know and then my mind started going and I and I know uh, and, uh, I just happen to know an amazing not just any old quilt artist but an amazing artistic quilt artist named Yolanda Van Heerden in uh, in Greenwood and she and I worked together through a nonprofit over there and so my mind just immediately ran with that and I was like oh my gosh like I could just see and feel I could just feel the crackling in the air of oh yes and so I thought ooh, I might you know and Yolani's also on the artist roster I'm pretty sure I'm thinking you know what I think this would be a, a great arts commission grant you know project and so and she I told her about the concept and she loved it and um what basically the concept ended up being, she and I kind of came up with it together. I always like to talk to the artist before I really, because I wanted it to be, I, I wanted to hire Yolandi Van Heerden to be our head artist. And I would be collaborating with her as Robin Whitfield artist and also as a director of Friends of Touching the Swamp. But I wanted her to be, you know, she and I are both used to, to working with community members and, and having them also showing them some sort of skill and having their unique take on things added into the mix. You know, we just, we're, we, she and I are very, you know, kind of, I guess we're very comfortable with that kind of flow. So I knew she would be a fun partner. So what we ended up doing or deciding is that we were going to pick 25, um, maybe it ended up being 26. It kept growing on us. I think it started up with 14, you know, things mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, with me and Yolandi, we can let things kind of, we, we can get into like this whirlwind of creativity. But I think we ended up with 26 plants and animals that um, you're pretty much guaranteed to see if you spend any time at uh, Church in the Swamp. And, um, and just in case I call it Leetart Nature Preserve, Chachuma Swamp is now located in what's called Leetart Nature Preserve. We, um, uh, it, it got its new name during the course of the purchasing of the trees. So those other, when I, if I say one or the other, they're, they're the same place. Chachuma Swamp is inside Leetart Nature Preserve. But anyway, so, um, so, you know, it's anything from like hummingbirds to I, I'm the one who came up with a list and I really tried to think about connections as I was making that list. Like I knew hummingbirds uh, re depended on jewelweed uh, for nectar and that um, maybe uh, things like uh, water tupelo and cypress are two of the main trees there and they attract like the pathonotary warbler which is uh, a threatened species and the mascot of our organization. So I was trying to think in terms of relationships so that the quilt would end up becoming um, each, we, we ended up going from one quilt to four smaller quilts. The quilt became so mm -hmm. huge, we decided it was gonna weigh like 80 pounds. <laughs> so we were gonna make four smaller quilts. And then, cause each, each square went from being like 10 by 10 to like 16 by 16 and I don't know. Cause we kept, so, so what the concept was, let me kind of go back to, so we had these 25, we took, we have all these photographs of these 26 plants and animals. We invited the community to these work days or these um, workshops and they um, got to, they, we made them draw a number out of a hat. Okay. So they could just had to basically 
whatever number they drew, you know, was attached to one of the plants or animals. And they had to go look at several of these photographs and look at all the fabric Yolandi had brought. She brought in all these amazing fabrics from South Africa, which is where she's from, as well as other American and Japanese fabrics, just a really beautiful collection. And they had to look at the photographs and not interpret the photograph literally like depict it like a photograph but get a sense of texture and color and relationship and maybe also use what they know about those plants and animals it's so funny most people out of the 26 plants and animals very few people who participated had ever even heard of them and they're the most common plants and animals you know in the swamp and so that was another really big plus on this project is everyone learned what lived there they got to have fun interpreting through color and texture the plant or animal and then they got to design kind of these abstract quilt squares and we were using kind of Yolani's really inspired by the G's Bend quilt style which is very intuitive you know you're just putting color and texture and kind of creating a, a, a design that might reflect a shape or something but it doesn't have to it can just be it's pure geometrical and kind of improv it's nothing it's not like one of those carefully where all the each square is going to have a, a a matching pattern throughout the quilt every square is like its own unique little abstract work of art so in the course of uh, three workshops we had um, community members pick out colors and kind of sew them and, and uh, Yolandi was, was had brought sewing machines and showed us what to do and anyway we also ended up having um, in a different workshop people hand embroider the name of each of the 26 plants and animals on pieces of khaki pants that people had donated also. We thought that would be the border strips in between kind of looking like nice earthy grass colors or, or, or dirt colors and make all the colorful squares pop. And it, it really works. It's beautiful. Oh my God. And Yolani and I were, we were excited from that first hour of the first workshop. We were both beyond excited because we saw it was beyond our wildest hopes of who showed up, how it affected them, what they were doing. It was just, it was just wildly amazing. I mean, truly magical. I think Yolani told me it was the most amazing project she'd ever done, which um, I hope she really means that, but um, cause she does some pretty cool stuff. But um, anyway, so we're still, we're actually, the project COVID happened right at, as we were finishing that project. And the last mm -hmm. part of the project was to quilt, put it all together and quilt it. And we were gonna have these community quilting bees where we got together and quilted it as a community. And uh, by the time March came around and we were ready to quilt, um, you know, we couldn't get together. So Yolandi has actually been slowly quilting it herself um, oh, wow. through all this time. She's almost finished. And we are planning on actually um, featuring the four quilts uh, at our uh, Halloween. Uh, we're going to be having a Halloween trail walk on October 31st at Lee Tart Nature Preserve. And so we're going to have these quilts featured at that event. Wow, that... That's amazing. You know, and with Yolandi working on it during this time, what a beautiful picture of this strange time that you're going to oh. have and, you know, for future archives and, and just, you know, of art and of history of this moment. And, you know, you mentioned how you were so excited about the people that showed up who showed up, like what, who, you know, what ages and what, you know, what what, yeah, that was what this, you know, it was just amazing because, you know, I'm sure if any of y'all listening try to do a community events where you don't have a known set of people showing up, either no one shows up or it's all everybody knows each other. But I'm going to say my board, we were so pleased. We talked about how it was for, for a small town. It was a very diverse crowd and like not every, most people didn't know each other. It was, uh, you know, we had like a, a Girl Scout troop show up. Oh, wow. We had... Um, uh, you know, a couple of artists show up. We had some school teachers show up. We had some older, uh, some older ladies who are a part of a quilting group in town uh, show up. Um, let me think. Uh, and of course, our board, you know, various board members and volunteers that work with us on a more regular basis. But uh, we had partnered with the public school to use one of their spaces for a Saturday in their in their Votec building. And um, and so. We, we tried to make it in a space where anyone might feel comfortable coming to it. That was a, you know, deep, we had to kind of think deeply about that because I think that's a part of having a successful community event is making it easily accessible and where everyone mm -hmm. feels welcome. So I felt like that the public school building was a, was a good choice and, and had a lot to do with it. Um, we had another event at the public library. Um, and I, those might've been, and we ended up, um, 
two of the workshops, one of the teachers invited us to come to her fourth and fifth grade gifted classroom where she was set up with sewing machines already and Yolani brought in some more and we had volunteer, we had participants from the first workshop volunteered to help us with the fourth graders in, an, in, a, in the two workshops that kind of came as a surprise. So we had like, we probably, was, we probably had a, easily one-on-one -on -one adult to child because the older quilters came in and some of our board members and just friends and, you know, just, it was just this wild, amazing students of one of the teachers came. I mean, it was just this crazy excitement over this project and the kids uh, having those fourth graders. I mean, they dove right into picking fabrics and they got to use sewing machines and make a whole square. I mean, it was just, and they had to do it collaboratively in teams. So, I mean, this is an extremely collaborative project and, um, where no one can claim a square as their own exactly, because most people just participated in one of the squares, maybe as a you know two or three team person team, but um, but the same I would say each workshop we had had a few people that were at each one, but we always had unique and new people come to each workshop. Well, I can tell you, you know, from an outside perspective, that the community was very excited because one morning. And I've told you this, but one morning I got to work and had a message on my phone from a gentleman from the community. He didn't say who he was, but just left the this, this sweetest, most excited message about how much he loved this project and just thanked the Mississippi Arts Commission for, for supporting this project and was just over the moon about how it had gone. So I can't wait to see what happens with it when you're all able to get back together. I know, me too. And and I'm going to tell you, I've just, you know, I've seen, I've seen it kind of laid out and practically put together, you know, I mean, not quilted, but sewn together. And, you know, it's like everything that becomes beautiful. We made these quilts. Remember the original board member was one, we wanted quilts, functional quilts that we could put on the ground for school groups to sit on and then be inspired by as they sat there and tried to connect what they were seeing in the real world with what was on the quilt but they're so beautiful I can already feel myself wanting to be careful with them but yet I don't want to be like you know, I want I, I really believe in having beautiful handmade art pieces be to me it's that that final like I was talking about my own art being seen if we use these quilts even if they end up getting some character on them because they get a stain of grass or dirt or, or get torn. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to talk myself into this. I want <laughs> us to use them, you know, and, and really have them, you know, just, I guess, deepen in their own personality and in our own imaginations by how they're used on, on site. So we'll see if I can, I'm always thinking, maybe I can bring a tarp to lay down. <laughs> and that's ridiculous. <laughs> but but, I, I, um, but I'm, I'm anxious to also just see how they continue to, um, uh, I guess inspire and become a part of our programming um, because I feel like a really beautiful things like this that are touched by so many people um, I don't know just inspire uh, all sorts of things that I can't even begin to guess. Mm. Well I know we probably have some people listening who are are interested in what what you do as a teacher and as a, a you know workshop facilitator and maybe want to like to get in on it themselves so tell us how you know tell us about your workshops and then how people can find you sure so um i've had a you know as, as we all have this year of covid i've not been teaching many workshops um but that is something i typically do a good bit of um I do have uh, some upcoming workshops in Greenwood coming up. Um, two of those workshops will be watercolor workshops and two will be um, an outdoor adventure workshops where we will be doing some exploring of natural pigments. Um, I developed a program called Delta Wild several years ago through Art Place. And so we're going to kind of revamp these Delta Wild excursions, um, inviting, you know, and they're for anybody, families, friend groups, just an individual who wants to come out. And we're going to be exploring the Azu Nature Trail on those. Um, we do similar workshops with me or other people. I'm constantly, as an artist, I know so many artists and I know the power of art. So through uh, Friends of Chachuma Swamp, we also, you know, constantly have uh, workshops going on. Um, the one that I would mention, it's not me teaching, but since we're talking about it, I'm, I can't help but want to mention this. Um, 
our upcoming we have an upcoming workshop on Halloween we're going to be doing a trail walk in the in the evening but that morning as a part of that trail experience we've invited uh, Sam Clark an artist from Madison to come up he sculpts um, these amazing trolls and, and dragons this is, a, is his profession so he's going to lead a sculpting workshop of you know fantastical creatures and then those who feel comfortable enough are going to be invited to sculpt a face on a tree. Oh, wow. And later that evening, those trees will be featured on our trail walk. So that's going to be fun on October 31st. If any listener thinks they want to come up to Grenada on Halloween, we invite anyone who wants to get their hands in some clay uh, and, get, and get, get that dirty. Um, and, and I'm always, you know, we had a cordage workshop recently that I didn't teach, but we had someone else come and show us how to get fibers from plants and turn that into ropes. Um, so we're always doing something with Friends of Chukchuma Swamp, and all that can be seen on our website. Um, it's, I believe it's friends-of-cs.org. And then robinwhitfield.com is how you can find out about the very specific ones that I teach. I do teach a whole, you know, I, I very commonly teach these what I call earth color workshops or mm. natural pigment workshops, different people who invite me to come and do them maybe might call them different things but I don't have any planned like there's nothing on the calendar right now but I know that anyone can invite me to to teach one or work with that with your group I you know I've been known to you know, teach in you know museum settings or club settings uh, garden clubs and school groups uh, that sort of thing I'm on the art Mississippi artist roster too through you know the Mississippi Arts Commission through y'all and can, uh, which does help uh, supplement um, uh, funding for workshops for me. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app.